Now we come to the topic that I want to spend the most time on, which is disillusionment. Uh, for the last few weeks, I've been talking to some uh, long-term, highly committed activists around the country, and what I'm finding is some people who are tremendously capable are experiencing profound disillusionment right now. Well, there's a lot of people very concerned and upset about the direction that animal advocacy has taken in our country, and the, the power of that disillusionment to take really terrific people out of the box, just knock people out of the box, sometimes for good, sometimes for a long time, is it's profound. So when disillusionment strikes, and that disillusionment derives from various experiences, which I'll get into, the question is, is are we willing to suspend our judgment and remain open to the possibility of healing? There's a lot of uncertainty and fear and pain that's associated with allowing ourselves to feel the disillusionment, and there's a real temptation to just go into a bitter, disempowered, angry state, which leads to disengagement and is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So disillusionment, we define as the process of discovering that cherished ideas about the nature of oneself, another, members of a group, or human society as a whole, are contradicted by direct life experience. You know, we all start out as bright, shiny pennies, and we're inspired, filled with a feeling that we can make a difference, and that we're going to change things. And then we go and knock up against the reality out there, and we're shown the limitations of our ideas and our limitations of ourselves, and we have that feeling of disillusionment. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the common causes of disillusionment that we've observed over the years. First one, personal limitations is pretty easy to understand. The justice issues on our planet are out of control, they're huge, and when we bump up against them, it, you know, whatever level of energy, intellect, moral strength, emotional capacity we have, the problem is just bigger, and it knocks us back. And that's, you know, often one experiences disillusionment. The scaling problem, as a small organization, we deal with this all the time, that, you know, your reward for accomplishing something in this work is that you learn more and more about what goes on and the, the pain and the suffering and the injustice that's out there. And you also, the more knowledge you have, the more responsibility you feel. And so there's this situation that you, it's like a self-limiting situation. The better you get at the work, the more you accomplish, the more you realize that you're, what you're not accomplishing. And that can cause crushing disillusionment. Now this third topic is the number one issue in people I've been talking to recently. And that would be contact with toxic ideas toxic individuals, toxic organizations, toxic social institutions. And I'm not throwing around the word toxic. I have a specific idea in mind. And what I would say is that the toxic poisoning our world is commodification. There's a very specific force that is spread through every level of our society. The act of converting a living being, a principle, or the natural environment itself into an object that is used, compromised, exchanged, or consumed in order to make a profit, satisfy a desire, gain publicity, accrue power, or pursue some other goal that very often has an addictive quality. That force is so pervasive in the lives of individuals, in the corporate world, and unfortunately it is found in the nonprofit world as well. When idealistic people become awakened and empowered to go out and make a difference, there is a belief inside of us that somehow the bad stuff is out there and now in here, in our circle of people trying to make a difference, we're not going to encounter that bad stuff. And that idea is it's a banana peel that you can really you know, step on and, and fly. As people who are looking to seek the positive, we tend to believe that any person or organization that's involved in a worthy cause must have noble intentions, must have integrity, and then you know, they're trustworthy and beyond reproach. And what happens is that we go so far into it and then discover, oh, it's not what I thought. And when, when we discover that, it's hitting us in a place that's very precious to us, and the pain of it is excruciating. I mean, it is excruciating. I have talked to people that are in such pain over this, they can barely speak of it. It's like a death in the family. It's at, at times I feel like I'm talking to people that have been through you know, the equivalent of like sexual abuse. It's so personal, it's so painful. And you know, it comes back to this idea that so many people drawn to justice causes have a value for seeing the positive in others, connecting with the positive and speaking to it, and it's a terrific thing. But there's a phenomenon that is more and more starting to be discussed, 
and you know, a lot of political developments in the United States over the last decade have brought this issue to light. And that is that there are individuals walking around this planet who maintain the appearance of normality, but they do not, in fact, possess the capacity for conscience that we all take for granted. They lack the ability to have that emotional identification with others, and because of that, they become capable of doing anything to advance their means and not feeling the burden of responsibility or guilt. Contact with such individuals is an absolutely devastating experience. It has devastated our country. A lot of times, you know, we're in a situation where people of this nature seem to be getting in charge of things and it wreaks havoc. So there's a Harvard psychologist, Martha Stout. She wrote a tremendous book called The Sociopath Next Door. And her research shows that approximately one in 25 people essentially lack the capacity for that emotional connection that creates conscience and at the same time are able to maintain an appearance of normality. So it's not something that's obvious. It's not like people are walking around with a hat that says, don't trust me. But there is something different about the way they're put together. And she uh, basically points out in her book that some of these individuals are drawn to justice causes because such an environment is a happy hunting ground for somebody that wants to you know, proceed without really being noticed. Everyone is so idealistic, looking for the good and wanting to see the good. And the darkness can hide in that scenario. And you know, this is a quote from her. In a confusing irony, conscience can be rendered partially blind because people without conscience use as weapons against us many of the fundamentally positive tools we need to hold society together. Empathetic emotions, sexual bonds, social and professional roles, regard for the compassionate and the creative, our desire to make the world a better place, and the organizing rule of authority. Being natural actors, conscienceless people can make full use of social and professional roles which constitute excellent ready-made masks that other people are loath to look behind. Now, I realize in bringing this up and in talking about this, I am myself becoming perhaps an agent of disillusionment. <laughs> That's ironic. but. It, it's something I feel must be done because it really is an issue. And you know, in, in dealing with this and talking about it, I often look at some of the things that happened in the Catholic Church over the last you know, decades, where the Catholic Church had an issue, where people who really shouldn't be in a position of trust and authority were in positions of trust and authority. A lot of people, a lot of children got hurt. I believe a lot of activists are being hurt. And it, it's upsetting to me. And I'm going to start talking about it. So I'm just putting everybody on notice. Um, <laughs> so what happens is that when idealistic activists have this experience, and it, it's, a, it's a very interesting phenomenon that as a person gets involved in a cause, they're drawn more and more to the center where the action is. And there's so much darkness and there's so much light at that point because the best in humanity and the worst of humanity are colliding. And it is just overwhelming. I've just talked to so many people who have been overwhelmed and damaged by discovering that people or organizations who they saw as role models, who they saw as trusted figures who were going to inspire them, were actually undermining or commodifying the cause or activists or even you know, those the cause is supposed to serve. It's very powerful. And you know, probably many of you have seen a documentary called The Corporation. And in The Corporation, they make very clear that the corporate structure which dominates our society has a little problem, which is that corporations, if you really looked at them as individuals, could be acting like psychopaths or sociopaths. As an institution, they don't have a particularly strong conscience. And unfortunately, nonprofit corporations can have the same qualities. It's just a fact. So when, when individuals who have this moral awakening contact this energy, there's this extraordinary disillusionment. And you know, what I've come to realize through my own encounters and experience of this is that I've come to believe that it's a rite of passage. It's inevitable. If in your heart you want to change this world for the better and you want to address injustice, it, that journey is going to take you into direct contact with the roots of it. You are going to experience the darkness. If you care about animals, you know, it's something I've said before, that the animals are shrouded in darkness to help them to reach out to them, we must enter the darkness. And this is one aspect of the darkness that we have to face, that there is this phenomenon that's wreaking a lot of havoc that is hidden, and it's disturbing. So this cause of disillusionment, or any of the others I've mentioned, it creates a complex inner struggle leading to the ninth step, 
a period of retreat. And I've observed this over and over in the lives of people I'm close to and others I've talked to. You know, it is almost literally like being knocked back. And there's a time of inner reflection. And the question is, are you going to give yourself time to absorb this powerful truth and gain the benefit of the wisdom it's going to give you? Or is there going to be a period of addiction because the pain is excruciating? It is really hard to stay present. And then the tenth step is integration and renewal. And that is a very exciting process, which is in the aftermath of really encountering something that overwhelms you and gives you great pain, finding that it also cleared away a lot of attachments. It also pulled away a lot of cobwebs, pulled aside a lot of veils, and there's a new vision of how to be more effective and a new understanding of what's actually causing the problem and how to change it. And you know, that this is such a moment, it's very hard work, but if one makes the choice, it can be revolutionary. And you know, what I've come to believe is that our spirits, just like our bodies, have an innate healing mechanism and that we are up to the job. We can handle this. And if we open ourselves to the journey, we can emerge from these very difficult experiences with new strength and new insight. So these are just some observations about what can help and what I've observed happens in people's lives. Internal study, the retreat period, sifting through the community. Very often one discovers that certain relationships aren't helpful and that one has kind of moved beyond a certain level of interacting and sometimes you have to let go. And there are also relationships that have a tremendous potential that need engagement and support. It's very important to have community. The number one cause of not successfully navigating disillusionment is isolation. Disillusionment causes isolation. Why? Because nobody can handle the despair of an altruist. Nobody can handle it. The people that are out there in their lives giving other people hope and, and you know, energizing change, when they hit bottom and they start to talk about what they're experiencing, most people just can't take it and they quickly give you the message, don't go there. <laughs> and so it's important to find other people who can take it, who are there with you and working through the same thing and have community, critical. Search for new role models. The new issue calls for a reinvigoration of one's understanding of what's possible. And I have to say I've been through this cycle a few too many times, but the, the thing that has always pulled me back is a handful of people in my life that I've been able to go to who have been there, who are way ahead of me, and I can talk to them and learn about their life, and also the study of history. Um, people have been on this journey since time began, and reading historical accounts of the lives of great moral leaders is the, big, the best medicine I know. Clean up one's act. Destructive habits and addictions have got to go, and they have to be replaced with healthier practices. The same thing with really recognizing that value contradictions become increasingly poisonous for people that are on this journey and moving forward. And the more advanced you get in your development, the more destructive the contradictions become, the more one must focus on uh, resolving them. Another critical step, number seven, neutralize the poisons of self-pity, bitterness, anger, and hatred. It truly is poison. And the disillusionment can result in hatred toward what one considers to be the cause of it. Could be individuals, organizations, humanity. What, you know, whatever, however you identify the cause, and it, naturally feelings of anger and hatred and bitterness arise. If we don't learn how to control those, neutralize them, and overcome them with deeper wisdom, they can poison a person. And I suspect we all know people that have been overcome by those feelings. And you know, people use different words to describe it. Jadedness is probably a word I would use. So. After that comes the opportunity to develop a deeper understanding of yourself, your values, and your mission in life, and to forge that vision and actualize it. And if you study the lives of people who have really made a huge difference in this world, it's amazing to see how consistent the pattern is. There's very few people who had a big revelation, went out and just implemented it for the rest of their lives and everything was great. Just, it hardly ever happens. Maybe, I don't know if it ever is. So it's part of our human experience to go through this cycle. So I've just taken you through this wheel that represents the process of moral development. 